Uh, this is Mary McConnell. I used to inflict comparative government on Juan Diego students, and Mr. Nelson is giving me this opportunity to do it again. Uh, before I dive into the complexities of current Russian politics, uh, let me talk about some of the abiding basics in Russian political culture. In many ways, the reason for Vladimir Putin's success and the reason why many people, myself included, find that success more than a little dismaying is that he understands and channels elements of Russia's political culture that are far, far older than his almost 15-year reign. And yes, I use the word reign pretty deliberately. First, Russia is a multi-ethnic society ruled over by Slavic Russians. At about the same time that white Americans were moving west, filling up the interior and obliterating, obliterating Indian tribes in their way, in other words, in the 19th century, Russian armies were moving east and conquering the non-Slavic, mostly Muslim ethnic groups in their way. Those red patches are Slavs and the bright red patches are ethnic Russians. The blue patches, patches are various Turkic peoples. The yellow patches, which are really too huge to be called patches, are mostly empty space, but to the extent that they are filled, they're mostly filled by non-Russians as well. So preserving this multi-ethnic empire and ethnic Russian supremacy are consistent goals of Russian politics, even if they're not always honestly acknowledged. Uh, this map should give you a good idea why Russians are nervous about ethnic diversity, if even if the continued terrorist attacks weren't enough to make them nervous. In a minute, I'm going to show you these two maps side by side. But basically, what this map shows is that the birth rate of ethnic Russians is way below the replacement rate. And although the map doesn't show this, the death rates, especially among males, are also very high. Male life expectancy in Russian, Russia is only 60 years, mostly due to the very high rates of alcoholism. So Russia is in a demographic nosedive. And red, by the way, means a very low birth rate. Green is high with yellow in between. You need to be sure you understand how to read this kind of map, since it's just the sort of graphic the College Board likes to have you analyze. Now, the Muslim Turkic people are reproducing at a much higher rate than ethnic Russians. Uh, right now, there are about 21 million of them, so they make up roughly 16% of the country's population. Uh, but by the end of this decade, that's going to be up to about 20%. And by the middle of the, by mid-century 2050 or so, uh, if current trends continue, then every other Russian might be uh, a Muslim Turk, of Muslim Turkic descent and not an ethnic Russian or an ethnic Slav. So it may be easier to see this point when both maps appear on the same slide. The bottom line, either Russians are going to need to embrace genuine multi-ethnic diversity and learn to live uh, with people who pursue a religion that is uh, not that of the ethnic Russians, or they're going to need to keep the lid on a growing population that does not share their religion, language, or loyalty. So far, uh, Putin and United Russia have embraced the second strategy. It remains to be seen how long they can get away with it. So violence in the days leading up to uh, the Winter Olympics highlights this threat. And so does Putin's heavy-handed response. So here's a photo from the Volgograd train station, which was hit by a bomb on December 29th, 2013. Uh, the suicide bombers have been tentatively identified as militants from the Muslim region of Dagestan. Uh, this CNN video, if you can still access it, will tell you more. But if you wonder why so many Russians put up with and even applaud Putin's heavy-handed techniques, this frankly is one answer. Another abiding element in Russian political culture has been a union of religion and state, with the state firmly in control of the religion and the religion at the service of the state. Putin has played on this tradition by establishing strong relations with the Russian Orthodox Church, one way in which uh, his... Uh, administration has been a real change from the communist era. Uh, by the way, the photo on the bottom shows the last czar, Nicholas II, with the Russian patriarch. You may notice some similarities. Uh, if you're wondering where 70 years of communism fits into this, think about it for a minute. Yeah, communism really was the state religion. It was probably one of the reasons that Russia was able to impose an ideology so successfully. They'd been doing it for hundreds of years. So, put another way, there's a long tradition of the state telling people what to believe. 
Okay, I was avoiding boring word slides as long as I could, but there was a limit. Now that I've already talked, note that I've already talked about the first two points. The inequality issue is hot in America right now, uh, but several commentators have noted that President Obama dropped his specific use of this word in the 2014 State of the Union address. Uh, we don't know exactly why, uh, but there's been a lot of speculation that it didn't pull well with focus groups. Americans worry about inequality, but our political culture still generally makes a distinction between everyone getting a fair shake and everyone crossing the same finish line at the same time. Russian society is much more economically and socially stratified than American, and maybe that's why there is more resentment of income and status differences and more support for state action against economic elites. So Vladimir Putin was able to jail several of the so-called oligarchs pretty much in defiance of legal due process and without all that much pushback. Russian political culture also has a rather toxic mix of anti-government sentiment combined with high expectations from government. Putin's autocratic methods have worked pretty well as long as the oil dollars have rolled in and a little of that money has been redistributed to the general population. I'm going to talk more about the economic policies and challenges uh, that Russia faces in my next lecture. So I'm writing this podcast the week before the Russian Olympics open. Here's a quote from this week's Economist uh, talking about the coming uh, games. The opening ceremony uh, will include the image of the Russian troika bird from Nikolai Gogol's Dead Souls. Rus, wrote Gogol, aren't you soaring like a spry troika that can't be overtaken? The road is smoking under you. The bridge is thunder. Everything steps aside and is left behind. Is this lightning thrown down from heaven? Other nations and states gaze askance, step off the road and give you right of way. Well, that's the image that accompanied that quote, by the way. Uh, Russia is spending $50 billion on the Winter Olympics. That's more than all the previous Winter Olympics combined, although according to at least one member of the International Olympic Committee, about a third of that money has already been stolen by corrupt contractors. So Russia cares a lot about its image. Uh, the decline in Russian power after the fall of the Soviet Union troubled many Russians, and nothing has been a higher priority for Putin than restoring Russia's leadership in the world. By the way, uh, here's a link to an article on this subject that I think is quite good. Oops, sorry. Uh, another abiding element of Russian political culture is a debate between the so-called Westerners, who think Russia should try to become more like Western Europe and the United States, and Slavophiles, who argue that Russia has a very different moral mission, has a different political culture, and should focus on leadership in the East. Uh, if you followed Russia's very heavy-handed tactics toward the Ukraine in the last couple of weeks, that's a good example of a Slavophilic policy. Now, Gorbachev and Yeltsin were Westerners, and so actually was Lenin, who was very much a modernizer. Stalin, by contrast, turned out to be an Easterner, and so is Putin. In case you haven't already guessed, this excerpt from Putin's December 2013 State of the Nation speech, that's the Russian State of the Union equivalent, is a not especially veiled reference to Russia's laws against homosexuals. Again, alas, this resonates with many Russians uh, and has helped Putin gain and keep the support of the Russian Orthodox Church. Okay, this isn't the history podcast. I'm going to try to make a history podcast before your AP exam. Uh, but I, So I'll pass over this review quickly. Understand that the experience under communism lives on in the minds of many Russians, and it continues to influence Russian politics. So it's worth noting that the Communist Party structure was highly centralized and elitist, the membership in the party, or in the nomenclature, and that's a term you need to know, uh, was the path to political and economic power, and that elections were a sham. Okay, this should be reviewed as well. Basically, Gorbachev tried to open up the system without fundamentally challenging its underlying premises or much altering its basic structures, and it didn't work. Neither in the short run did Yeltsin's shock 
therapy strategy of moving immediately to a market economy. Of course, Yeltsin sold off most of the country's assets to his buddies, which didn't help, and he did not sell them at market prices. Some of it was just plain stolen or given away. And the eventual rise of a substantial entrepreneurial class in Russia actually points to some long-term successes of this program, although they didn't come soon enough to help Yeltsin. But for the most part, Yeltsin's policies, especially when they were followed uh, by more universal prosperity under Putin, reinforced Russians' preferences for state control. Okay, this is a very busy slide, and you can read it for yourself. Count yourselves fortunate. I used to have to teach a very complicated Russian election system to students. Putin made your life a lot easier in 2005 by simplifying the system, uh, which also not accidentally made it easier for members of the United Russia Party to get elected. Basically, elections for the Duma are held every four years, and members are chosen by proportional representation. To get seats in the Duma, a party has to earn at least 7% of the vote, which has pretty much driven the various liberal parties out of the legislature and eliminated regional candidates uh, that were so commonly elected in the Yeltsin years. If no presidential candidate wins a majority of the votes, there's a runoff election. Hasn't happened since 2000, but when the Putin era is over, that could change. So I also used to spend a lot of time talking about a bunch of Russian political parties. I'm not going to bother. Right now, Russian politics are all about Putin's party of power, United Russia. Still, the College Board sometimes asks about other parties. So here's a quick overview of the rest, and I'll talk about United Russia in a minute. The Communist Party remains the second strongest party, and it actually won uh, substantially more Duma seats in the 2011 election than in the 2007 election, and that was widely interpreted as an anti-Putin protest vote. Uh, the Communist Party advocates even more government control of the economy, but it tends to support Putin in his nationalism and anti-Western emphasis. Just Russia was really a Putin-orchestrated United Russia spinoff. Uh, United Russia was coming under criticism for returning Russia to a one-party state, so Putin creates his own second party uh, to create a fake sense of party competition. Just Russia was slightly more supportive of Medvedev's uh, not very vigorous uh, or successful economic reform measures uh, than United Russia was, but essentially this was a sham party. The liberal reform parties, and I'm not going to bother listing their names, uh, generally support freer markets and civil liberties. In 2011, they won no seats in the Duma. And just to make your life complicated, the so-called liberal democratic party, which, by the way, the College Board really likes to ask about, is neither liberal nor democratic. It's nationalist, fascist, anti-Semitic, and thoroughly creepy. Uh, but in practice, this party, too, tends to support Putin. Don't they all? Okay, United Russia is a party of power. Um, by this, I mean a party that is so closely allied uh, with the with the ruling authorities that there's really no distinction between party and, and governmental politics. A good parallel, and one that the College Board might very well ask you to make, is with the PRI in Mexico uh, before Zedillo's reforms and, and then the election of 2000. So United Russia is basically a vehicle for presidential power. Uh, it was a party specifically created to support Putin's candidacy. Interestingly enough, it was uh, uh, created by a bunch of oligarchs, several of whom Putin uh, promptly threw into jail after they got him elected. Uh, United Russia has dominated Russian politics ever since 2000, even though uh, even with widespread fraud, its percentages were down a little in the Duma vote of 2011 and the presidential vote of 2012. But actually, even commentators who write about election fraud pretty much acknowledge that United Russia is still Russia's majority party, cheating notwithstanding. Uh, so here are the results of the most recent Duma elections in December 2011. Uh, the numbers aren't going to add up properly since I've rounded. You don't need to memorize these numbers, but you should have a general sense of how the vote divided up. Voter turnout, by the way, is pretty high in Russia, although both recent elections for the Duma in 2011 and the presidency in 2012 seem to have involved a fair amount of, of ballot stuffing. In fact, the blatant voter fraud in 2011 uh, Duma elections led to a wave of protest. 
after the election, an estimated of 100,000 Russians, mostly middle class, mostly fairly young, gathered in the center of Moscow. It was the largest protest since the Soviet era. And it looked for a while as if a real opposition to Putin might be forming. But after some major crackdowns, most of this protest has petered out, although there continues to be a lot of criticism of Putin. And here we see the results of the 2012 presidential election, which is the election where Medvedev stepped down to let Putin run again. The Constitution uh, only allows a president to run for two consecutive terms, but doesn't limit the number of non-consecutive terms. So here's how The Economist described this election at the time. And I quote, three of the men running against Mr. Putin, Gennady Zhuganov of the Communist Party, Vladimir Zhirinovsky, the clown nationalist, and Sergei Mironov, the leader of the Just Russia, a party initially created by the Kremlin as fake competition for Mr. Putin's united Russia, have for years been in the business of losing elections. The only fresh face is that of Mikhail Prokhorov, a liberal business tycoon. He actually has his own agenda, but was allowed to run despite this handicap because his support was seen as very narrow. There were more protests after this election, by the way, I'm finished with the economist quote, especially in the big cities and especially among the young. But what's more interesting was that polls show some decline in support among the elderly and the poor, uh, who had always been big Putin backers. But almost two years have passed since this election, and Putin still seems to be riding pretty high. He certainly f has a firm grip on control even if his support is slipping a little. A recent poll, and by recent I mean uh, January 2014, shows his support at 62%. By the way, the poll was conducted by Reuters, which is an American polling organization. So that, that support is high by American standards. President Obama would be very happy to be getting a 62% approval rating right now, as would President Bush before him. Uh, but Putin's approval ratings were above 70% for all of his first presidency from 2000 to 2008. So, here's a quick summary of political parties in Russia. Basically, the whole system is so dominated by Vladimir Putin that it's hard to talk about a party system per se. There's really no way of knowing whether the United Russia dominance will continue after Putin has left the scene, probably feet first. Uh, let me finish up with a quick review of some of the other topics that the College Board expects you to know. A major weakness of Russian democracy is that it has few non-governmental institutions. Uh, or to use AP government terms, it doesn't have very many linkage institutions, and it has a weak civil society. Most Russians don't attend church. They don't engage with their political leaders, you know, write letters to the editor, etc. They don't belong to organized clubs or groups. In the early post-communist years, a lot of these groups did spring up, especially groups trying to deal with the huge environmental uh, decay that had taken place under communism. But government restrictions on non-governmental organizations, especially any that receive foreign funding or support, and a lot of the environmental groups, for example, did that, uh, these restrictions have seriously undermined many of these organizations. Now, there are organized interests in Russia. Unfortunately, they're mostly criminal, and they're mostly on the take. Uh, when elements of the economy were privatized, basically uh, a bunch of leading party officials or people with strong ties to the leadership essentially grabbed the assets and, and privatized them for themselves. So the result is what your textbook calls state corporatism. Uh, corrupt ties between government and business interests with the growing Russian, Russian mafia collecting payoffs from everyone. Using government offices as a source of private wealth is a huge problem in most of the countries you're studying, really all of them except Britain. Since Putin's re-election, there's been even more crackdown and dissent, so immediate prospects for a more vibrant civil society in Russia are not promising. Basically, what you need to know about the media is that Putin has it almost entirely under his control, and the only parts he isn't controlling are the ones he doesn't care about very much. So uh, there will be liberal political journals that are read only by a few thousand people, and he just doesn't bother. Most Russians get their news from TV, and TV is rigorously controlled, particularly accessed by candidates during the election. And by the way, uh, in recent years, I say recent years, actually over the last few years, there have been several prominent prominent journalists who have been critical of the government who have been found murdered. Uh, and there's very little doubt 
that this is orchestrated by the government and that crackdown continues.